Can a man be both exceptionally strong and exceptionally sensitive? Is it possible for us to be cool, calm, and collected, and yet also expressive and passionate and emotionally intelligent? The common sense answer is yes. Of course a man can be both, but the honest, nuanced answer, at least in terms of psychology, male psychology in particular, is that it's very difficult to define and delineate when a man should be swung either way or the other. When should he be a hard man and when should he be a soft man? Because we know that most men feel their best when they are devoted and disciplined towards a directional goal that means something to them. They are on the path of purpose. But we don't want to fall into the trap of sacrificing our spiritual sensitivity and our emotional fluidity. Otherwise, we end up in a position where we climb to the top of the ladder, we achieve the things that we wanted to achieve, and yet our heart remains closed off. We don't actually get to experience the benefits of everything that we worked for, and this is particularly tricky territory when it comes to love and family. We want to be there for the people who mean something for us. We want to be there in the experience for those who we were devoted to. So how do we find this balancing point and this blending point between the hard man and the soft man, between the tyrant and the weakling, and working somewhere, archetypally speaking, along that spectrum? Well, in today's video, I'm going to be doing a very roundabout answer to this question from someone who identifies as a highly sensitive person and is interested in learning how to defend and assert themselves in a world which apparently sees sensitivity as a weakness. It's somewhat of a strange question to be taking for a video like this because I should have maybe done a video about how to create energetic boundaries and how to assert yourself into the world, but I've already done that video and I've also already spoken about emotional intelligence before, so I thought we could blend it together in a way that would really speak to the masculine heart. And it's this core idea of balance and blending and seasonality between the archetypal weakling which is an undercharged, overly sensitive, cowardly position, and the archetypal tyrant, which is the demanding, controlling, punitive, masochistic individual. Where do we find ourselves along that spectrum? Ask yourself right now, on a day-to-day -day basis, if tyrant energy, whatever that means to you, is plus five, dictatorial, abusive father energy, and minus five is the scared little boy clinging to his mother's skirt. Where do you generally situate yourself in life? When I'm working with men in therapeutic space, it's no surprise that any man who goes into therapeutic space generally has a wider degree of consciousness in terms of their opportunities and their availability to explore different elements of their masculinity. Most men that I work with will tend to be swung slightly towards weakling, it will be maybe a minus one, minus two, and part of the therapeutic process is bringing them into healthy assertion. The person who asked today's question is maybe archetypally speaking a little bit undercharged. They're swung towards boy consciousness and they're not quite in man consciousness because for simplicity's sake, the man knows how to defend his boundaries and assert himself into the world in a way which does not cause harm and brings about generativity. This is the archetypal king who may lead a mission out into the wilderness and encounter the dangerous animals and the dangerous plants with a small band of men going through that assertive push, going through the territory, cutting down with the machete and leading the charge for a new settlement so that the village can expand. He asserted himself into unknown chaotic territory to create something which is life-nourishing, and then, of course, the archetypal responsibility of the king and the warriors of the king in that situation is to defend the boundaries of the new encampment. It's to stop the jaguars and the roaming packs of wolves from getting in and hurting the women and children. It's very much the, 
you know, the narrative fantasy space, but there's something about this myth which really lives inside of men. We know that we're meant to be pushing. We're meant to be asserting. It's the phallic principle. You only need to look down between your legs to realize that you've got assertive energy. We want to penetrate. We want to penetrate the world. We want to penetrate new ideas, new spaces, new growth potential. That's inside of every man. And we realize if we haven't got that ability, we start to feel painful. We start to feel like we're being taken advantage of or we're being trampled all over by our boss or our girlfriend. If we're overly situated towards the weakling territory. If you are looking for a book to read, of course, I can't do a video like this and not read the classic that you've probably read yourself. You recognize Weakling Tyrant. It comes from the spectrum of the archetypal king in King, Warrior, Magician, and Lover, the undercharged and the overcharged position. It's a wonderful concept, which is incredibly practical. This kind of book is really the foundation for men's work. If you haven't read it, read it now. Of course, you've seen it before, so I'm not going to go too much into that that work in particular, but I will bring up another book in a second after expanding out this weakling tyrant concept and how it relates to energetic sensitivity and having that healthy blending point between the king who asserts into the wilderness and creates the new encampment, but also the king, very much like Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, who knows how to be a healer or a steward of the land, someone who's connected with the earth, someone who cares in the movie, he is very much the the main character, some would say Frodo is the main character, but I would say that Aragorn is ultimately the main character whose story arc develops throughout the three films and gets to the final point where he is crowned king because of his competence, his character, and fundamentally, in that final closing scene of the film, he leads the bow before the hobbits, who were the real main characters. Our imagination hooks onto a character like Aragorn, forgetting, of course, that truly he is in service of that which is more vulnerable, those who are more vulnerable, and the people who need his care. And he leads that moment at the very end of the film where everyone bows towards the four hobbits, and it's a very emotional moment. Why would a king do that? Why would the man who has the most power in the kingdom bow towards the weakest creature. It's symbolically very important. It's this idea of being a steward of nature. In fact, in this book that I'm going to recommend here, Messages Men Here, we have this idea of being a steward or a standard bearer. And uh, actually, let's go into that for a moment. The reason I'm bringing this book up is that there are a variety of archetypal messages that every man hears. I'm going to read them through in a moment, but some of them all cluster together. So for example, the standard bearer archetype is a mixture of the archetypes of nature lover, scholar, be the best that you can, and the sensitive man. And those traits very much do come through in a character like Aragorn, a quote from the book, um, who is the standard bearer. They are rescuers, helping others in need. Being a standard bearer implies acting out of feelings of love, which are reciprocated, so that a man who cares for others receives care from others and is able to love even more. Standard bearers are motivated by a desire to excel. Not satisfied with the status quo, they strive to improve the world. They care for quality and strive to be the best they can. Like a farmer in New England building a stone wall, standard bearers take great care to build something that will last. A monument to their time here on earth, even though Farmers do not leave their names by the walls that they built. They take satisfaction in making a positive contribution. Final sentence, a true standard bearer never rests on his laurels. Men who are standard bearers get their rewards from realizing those standards and not from pleasing others. But what is the standard bearer? Well, we can go back a few pages in this book and hopefully find a list of the messages that men hear. One moment. There we go. Pick this book up for yourself. It's a 1995 book. It's almost uh, fully, um, you know, it, it deals with more or less the whole ter territory of the masculine psyche. So I recommend that you go into it. The standard bearer is um, a mixture, again, of nature lover, nurturer, scholar, and Good Samaritan, but these are the other stories that we hear. We'll weave it all back in together. It's a roundabout way. Trust me, we're going somewhere with this. 
So these are some of the messages that men hear from boyhood to adulthood. They're encapsulated into archetypal themes. Pay attention to them and see which ones you resonate with the most. There are definitely some that I like to draw upon and others I'm not too interested in. So here are the male messages. The adventurer. The be like your father. The be the best you can. The breadwinner. Control. Faithful husband. Good Samaritan. Hurdles. Hurdles being you have to go through obstacles. Money. Nature lover. Nurturer. Playboy. President. Rebel. Scholar. Self-reliant. Sportsman. Stoic. Superman. Technician. The law. Tough guy. Warrior. Work ethic. Language-wise, reading those out, it's a little bit clumsy, but the book goes into the idea, as you can see on the page, of what each particular message means when a man takes that on as their core identity. And the reason that I made that several minute loop around is that when we're coming to the idea of being a sensitive man who also has the strength and the capacity to defend and assert himself, we need to really draw upon the messages that we've yet to integrate. For a man who generally identifies as the more sensitive man, he's more of a creative, artistic type, and he can feel the energy in a room, and always seems to know where things are going to go one step before everyone else because of his energetic perception. He may also be very spiritually open, he might have had visionary experiences, maybe he's an artist, or maybe he's an incredible lover in the bedroom because he knows how to work with energy. That's wonderful. But for him to take that information that's coming in from the world, he needs to be able to hold it, hold on to it, and then do something with it. He needs to add his consciousness in and assert it back out into the world. Of course, to be a lover in the bedroom and to be able to read your partner's face and read her body and know what you need to do to bring it to that next level of connectivity and depth and presence... It's all very well and good you being able to see that a certain facial gesture or a certain moment of her back arching upwards means that she wants a certain thing. If you can't assert yourself in that moment, you miss the opportunity to deepen the connection. You miss the opportunity to deepen the love between you in that moment. We need to find that blend between sensitive receptivity and the assertive principle, which goes towards tyrant energy. Again, tyrant, way too assertive. Weakling, completely unassertive. It depends on the moment, and in certain moments we'll need to situate ourselves way more in tyrant consciousness without becoming a tyrant. What I recommend very often for the men that I work with one-to-one is if they realize that they're minus two weakling as a general default pattern, they kind of let people get away with things, they really let conflict slide, and they just don't, they don't want to put up a fight. They're going to feel like asserting a boundary such as, hey, I know that we used to do things this way before, but I'm no longer available for this kind of behavior, i.e. I don't go out and drink anymore. Or with their romantic partner, there's a moment where, you know what, I know that we used to play around this way where we used to tease each other, but that particular phrase that you keep calling me, it no longer sits well with me, and I don't want you to say that anymore. da 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 I understand, but I I don't like that anymore, and I think we can do better and learn to play in new ways. If he holds his ground, he might think that he's gone from minus two all the way to plus five territory of being an absolute tyrant in that moment. The reality is, he's just come back to center. Subjectively speaking, he's going to feel like he's overcompensating all the way towards the overcharged position, but each moment where he gets to assert a boundary, which is interesting, right? You're asserting a defensive structure. You're creating a limit towards what people are allowed to do to you and what you tolerate before then giving a bit of a consequence. The consequence is implied in most situations. And if you're with someone who respects you, hopefully your romantic partner or a friend, and you say, I'm no longer going to be going out drinking with you, they might put up a bit of a, you know, kind of teasing you moment, but Ultimately, it gives them an opportunity to respond to the new version of you, and you get to solidify that new identity with each moment of moving yourself along the spectrum from sensitive and soft to hard and assertive. But even in this space, you can see how it's almost a false duality. 
why do we need to maintain that idea that there is such a thing as weakling and tyrant? It's very useful at a certain stage in the healing journey, because if someone's way too undercharged, they need to know that they have the ability to actually put themselves out there and get what they want. If someone's more in a tyrant position, which is actually something that I've gone through personally, I had to learn how to be a little bit less bullying, a little bit less controlling. I wasn't like plus five tyrant, but maybe like a plus one, being a bit too rough with my play, being a bit too um, sharp with my jokes, being a bit too caustic, learning how to soften. And people watching these videos might think like, no way were you ever in a bully mentality. And I wasn't, I wasn't like actively beating people up. But the point of an archetypal reality is that it's more about the internal texture. It's more about how you feel on the inside. And if as a man you externally present, here's where it gets complex, you externally present as the weakling who lets anything happen to him, but internally you're full of vengeance fantasies and vindictive judgmental attacks on their character, even if you don't say them, you're still experiencing the reality of the tyrant, even if you're externalizing as a weakling. So it gets more and more complex the more honest you become about your own energetic patterns. If you learn which of the messages that you took in became your core messages, and you read a book like King Warrior Magician Lover and look at your archetypal reality and try and find the blending point and the balancing point, you won't need to ask questions like, how do I defend myself and assert myself, and why is sensitivity viewed as a weakness? I almost paused with a moment of, huh? Like, wait, what? When that questioner said, because sensitivity is viewed as a weakness. I haven't existed in a reality where sensitivity is viewed as a weakness for years. Maybe when I grew up, maybe the culture that I grew up in, football, drinking culture in the UK, in the Midlands in the UK, near Birmingham, that was, uh, that was kind of the vibe. Now? It's not the case at all, because I know that through my sensitivity and the work that I do therapeutically, my sensitivity, cliche phrase, my sensitivity is my strength. But it also allows me to fulfill certain masculine goals, a sense of masculine devotion, a sense of masculine purpose, because I know that my emotional intelligence and my spiritual intelligence and my ability to perceive things which are not literal, my symbolic intelligence, all of those traditionally non-masculine things also support my ability to continue to expand my business and deliver incredibly supportive results to the people that I work with one-to-one -one and also this YouTube channel. I know that my sensitivity deeply is very much a strength and it seemed almost absurd for me to imagine that sensitivity would be regarded as a weakness and I suppose the idea which is being brought up is that of course sensitivity is regarded as a, uh, regarded as a weakness if it's not complemented with traditional, hard masculine traits. A man who can look you in the eye with a bit of a tear welling up over here, a bit of a, bit of a tightness in his throat, and say, hey, I know you didn't mean that, but that really hurt me, and I, I need better from you. And he can, he can hold that tension, or he can hold the tension of, Work's really difficult right now. I'm really stressed. I I know I can get through this, but it, it's really tough. And I um, I could do with a little bit of extra support right now. Are you free tomorrow to have a call? That kind of energy, that, that, that awareness of his own vulnerability, not his weakness, his vulnerability and his ability to be honest with what he's feeling is certainly not a weakness. In any degree, he's being real. He's got a strong masculine heart. He has the presence of his heart imbuing all of his life situations. It's not a weakness. It's obviously not a weakness. It's a strange old narrative. But for the sake of language, and even within this video, I had to artificially um, separate the spectrum of tyrant and weakling. And of course, is the weakling sensitive? That kind of compartmentalizes that only the weakling could be the sensitive one and that the true king could not be sensitive. But again, we return back to the character of Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, and he is both a warrior, a commander, a leader, a king, and also a healer, and a singer, and a tender touch kind of man when it's appropriate. The key point is appropriateness, seasonality, 
and proportionality. If Aragorn's going to be defending Helm's Deep from the army of the orcs, and he's like, hmm, this is a good time to write a poem and sing in Elvish to just really, you know, just really be who I am and just really feel what I'm feeling. And he fails to give the command to the elven archers and he's just singing about how much he misses his girlfriend. Everyone dies. It's not appropriate. And at the same time, if he's in warrior mode and he's got his sword in his sheath and he pulls it out like this, when actually he's going to go for a nice nature walk with his child, let's imagine, he's a bit of a nutter. He's, uh, he's really gone off the deep end. He doesn't understand appropriateness. And if we did see an alternative Lord of the Rings timeline where Aragorn went completely off the rails and his various character elements came through at the wrong moments... That's what would make him an untrustworthy man, because a truly mature and trustable man knows which elements of his personality and which elements of his soul are relevant and appropriate for the different situations of life. You can count on him to calibrate. Calibration being the end point that I'll wrap this video up on. The calibration point is not always the middle point. It's not being at a zero. Sometimes in an argument with a colleague, it might be appropriate, tactically speaking, for you to go towards more of a minus one weakling position and lean back. At other times, it could be appropriate for you to lean in and say, don't do this. Bit stronger, bit stronger, bit more towards tyrant energy. It depends on your awareness. It depends on the situation. The calibration point is fluid and it depends upon the chapters of your life and the situations you find yourself in. A highly sensitive person, male or female, is generally not, again, it's a generalization. I've noticed working with these kinds of people, I'm also this kind of person at times myself, they will generally benefit from going more towards the overcharge position and learning the power of no. I don't like that. I don't want to do that. I'm not helping you. I'm sorry. I'm not available. All of those sentences said fluidly through an open throat. That's the healing journey for them. Someone else might need more of a... I'm sorry. Um, drop the ego and drop the persona. I'm sorry. I screwed up there. That was mean of me. That was cruel of me. That was insensitive of me. They come back down from tyrant. You as an individual, you decide where you're at at any particular moment because the mature man makes his own decisions and he calibrates based on his awareness and what's appropriate for each individual situation. I can't give you the answer for that. No one can give you the answer for any particular life situation apart from your ability to walk the spectrum to be familiar with the many archetypes and the many messages, the many stories, the many expressions that you could hold and know when to step into each one of them, know when to step back into others. And if you can find that balancing point, if you can find that blending point, you can eventually drop the dualities and you will just be simultaneously a strong and sensitive man, cool, calm and collected and passionately excited when a butterfly goes by and emotionally sensitive when you see a child cry. We can do it all. Take some practice, but I truly believe we can. And I'm very excited to see just how many men really are taking on this responsibility to expand what it means to be a man without abandoning the best of traditional masculinity or getting lost in stories which don't actually feel men, don't actually make men feel very strong at all, i.e. the uh, lie down and remove your guts from life kind of situation that sometimes we're fed. I'll leave it there. Thank you for, for your attention on the video. Here's the next one. Hopefully, we'll all get to show up as the men that we are, but if we need to be a bit of a weakling or a tyrant for that video in particular, then I guess that's, what re that's what's required. I need some water. I'm going to see you over there.